Thank you very much, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, it's a pleasure to be in Paris, and it's a particular pleasure to talk at this uh, conference in honor of Fontaine and Van Um I think most of the other speakers have a closer connection to, to both of them than I do, but uh, I just wanted to say a couple of remarks at the beginning about um, their, their, well, that we a lot throughout the talk about both of their work in some sense. Um, but in fact, they were both very important for me. So very early on, the, the first thing I did in my career was um, some work on companion forms and the weight part of Sayre's conjecture. And I realized I had to compute. Uh, I was trying to do some lifting, uh, well, I'll talk about it in a bit. And at the time, there was only a method of uh, Ramakrishna for constructing lifts of global representations mod p to characteristic zero. And one requirement of this, which has, has been removed recently by uh, Patrikis and Kare and uh, Fakhrudin, uh, sorry, <coughs> Fakhrudin, um, is, um, is that you needed local deformation rings to be formally smooth. So you needed to know they were given by a power series ring. And the context in which I was going to need to apply this result was some, some potentially bustily Tate deformation rings. And you could try and compute these things using uh, Broy modules. Uh, but I tried to compute them, and I just couldn't. Uh, eventually, uh, some years later, uh, Ariane and Christophe uh, broy mezard computed these things completely and beautifully. But I look at their computations, and I could never have done them. But I was kind of saved from having a disaster of just not being able to do these things, because uh, Kari and Vantenberger in around 2004 um, found a new method for, for producing lifts, which I will talk about in the second half of the talk today, which was the Kari Vantenberger method. And this required far fewer hypotheses. This basically needed no hypotheses at all. So Vantenberger kind of incidentally saved me by completely removing the need to do this horrible computation that I was stuck on for six months. Um, and the Kari Vantenberger method, in fact, is something I've used. Uh, a lot, um, and I'll, I'll talk about a bit today. So, so that was kind of my connection with Vantin Berger. Um, there's also another connection with some, some work of one of his students, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and Fontaine, uh, in fact, so, so this, this work I'm talking about today is all with Matt Emerton. And uh, this project started in, I think, March of 2011. And uh, we finally finished the paper a couple of months ago. So I think it's like by far the longest project I was ever involved in. But um, I think a, a, a month or two later, sort of around May, June 2011, we were both working at Northwestern in Chicago at the time. And Fontaine visited for, for a month or so. And uh, he b basically kind of corrected all of our misconceptions about how modulo spaces of phi gamma modules and Fontaine phi modules and so on would work. Um, so that was kind of crucial early on, because we had some, uh, some early ideas. And if you look back at them now, they're just completely wrong. And I think without him patiently explaining to us where everything, how everything actually worked. It would never have got going. Um, and then several times in the years in between, uh, he was very helpful. In particular, uh, kind of the last time I saw Fontaine was last summer. Um, there was a special program in Lyon, and I came and gave four lectures there. And uh, it was somehow pretty intimidating, because I had Rappaport asking lots of uh, questions, and somehow I can never answer his questions. But luckily, and they were very basic questions about figure modules often, and sort of the behavior, but I would, get, I would get confused. But then Fontaine would helpfully answer all the questions. And so he kind of saved me from a complete nightmare there. Um, so I'm kind of very grateful for all of that. Um, and on one sort of personal note, there was uh, one summer, I don't remember when, probably four or five years ago, some conference in Lumini. And uh, I, would I always go on to my wife about how great Lumini is for conferences, and it's a great place to visit. So once she came to a conference there, and it was an extremely hot summer so hot that you couldn't go outside most of the day. Uh, I think it was also that time, there was some time when the cooking uh, changed at Lumini, and it was kind of the unique low point of these things. And she's a vegetarian, so like, she would <laughs> kind of have to sit inside all day while we were at talks and then come and have this food. And it was not so much fun. But um, I think the one thing that saved it was that, um, and, and she always remembers this, that uh, we would go to lunch and sometimes also go into a conference and you're talking to mathematicians and sometimes this is not so easy. But anyway, Fontaine was always really great to talk to. Um, and uh, yeah, I miss him. I'm sure you all do. Um, OK, so some mathematics. So uh, theorem. Let me start by stating the theorems. So theorem one, uh, there's basically a local theorem and a global theorem. 
So k over qp is going to be a finite extension, arbitrary finite extension, and rho bar is going to be uh, what dimension? D dimensional mod p representation. Uh, and always my representations, mod p or p adic, will be continuous with respect to, I mean, here the discrete topology and the profinite topology. Uh, I could, instead of having fp bar coefficients, put some finite extension that will be valued in a finite extension of fp, but I, wherever possible, I'm just going to write fp bar to try and avoid um, kind of making my coefficients big enough. So then the theorem is that uh, there exists a representation rho to uh, GLD uh, ZP bar. Again, continuous. I think this is the last time I'll say my representations are continuous. Uh, and it lifts rho bar, so in the sense that this modulo the maximum ideal is just this. So in fact, that would already, I think, be a, a theorem that wasn't known before. In fact, we can say more about it. Um, we can arrange. No, no. Definitely not irreducible. I'll explain in a minute that irreducible is kind of basically trivial for this theorem. Uh, so we can arrange that the, when you invert p, uh, that this is actually a crystalline representation. Uh, with distinct Hodge tape weights. In fact, this is basically what comes out naturally from our construction. But it, it, so it doesn't, in some sense, seem to be any easier to construct lifts uh, without this property. But you might imagine, I mean, it's possible there is some argument that we don't know. Um, and furthermore, I won't explain this condition, but it's useful, very useful in practice. You can arrange that it's uh, what's called potentially diagonalizable. Uh, maybe I can just say some, some particular case of this is that if, uh, if rho bar is the kind of the opposite of being uh, irreducible, if it's an extension of, <coughs> of characters, um, so all the, this is some filtration by one dimensional uh, subquotients, then you can arrange that rho uh, is arran can, can be arranged to also be of this form. So it can rearrange to be ordinary. So that's also sometimes useful. Yes, I mean, this is somewhat surprising if you haven't ever thought about this question, but it, in some sense, this is the hardest case. Is Ordinary means uh, that the lift is also an extension of characters, successive extension of characters, and the Hodge tape weights are strictly increasing. So it would be something like, in Christoph's talk, there was this example of uh, things that looked like this, where epsilon is the cyclotomic character. So something like this would be ordinary, but I wouldn't allow you to swap these two characters around. OK, and of course, the, so the flag lifts the flag. Yes. Yes. And, and there is, a, and in general, when the representation is reducible and you have a, a, a Jordan Holder series, then you can lift it to, a, to one for the lift? I don't know that unless they're all one dimensional, I think. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if I've thought so much about that. I'm, I might expect that was true, but I'm not sure off the top of my head if that's what our proof gives. So let me, let me be careful. But certainly in the rank one case, it's exactly what comes out. I mean, in general, what happens in the higher rank case is something to do with this condition, but I'm not going to talk about, about that today. Uh, any other questions about this theorem before I state theorem two? OK, so theorem two is some kind of related global result. Oh, sorry. Is ZP bar complete? Is ZP bar complete? Uh, no. But it doesn't really matter what I choose. I mean, in practice, what the, the proof actually, you replace FP with a finite extension, you replace this with the ring of inches in a finite extension. This is just a convenient way to make a true statement without. Yeah, I think it's remarked somewhere. I mean, 
that it's automatically automatically lands in GLD of some ring of things. Right, it follows from uh, bare category theorem and compactness. Yeah, exactly. No, it's just kind of irritating, and, and I think you have to be a bit careful in that. At least with our arguments, I'd be a little nervous about if I just replaced it, if I just wrote FP, whether I could actually lift to ZP, for example. I think you have to be a bit careful. There's rationality issues. It's sometimes convenient to have a ramified extension of the coefficients. Uh, we'll come to that. Any other questions? OK, so the global version, uh, let me make sure I don't miss a hypothesis. Oh, I should also, sorry, I should miss the, the kind of remark. This was previously known. Perhaps I should erase this ordinary representation. Uh, in the case that d is at most 3. Um, so this is a theorem of uh, Alain Muller. Um, in his PhD thesis, supervised by Vanton Berger, uh, he proved this. And already here, it's not so easy to prove this um, kind of by a bare hands approach in the case of a, an extension of three characters. It's kind of, for most choices of characters, it's kind of easy enough, but in general, there's actually quite a bit of work to do this. Um, various people thought about this problem before, and I think there are probably unpublished works where people maybe, I think, did sort of d equals four maybe, but even d equals five, there starts to be a real problem trying to do it by hand. Okay, sorry, so back to theorem two. So assume now that, make a, a mild assumption on p, relative to d, so let's assume that p is not 2 and doesn't divide d, uh, then there exists, so let me, I'm going to maintain my notation from up there, uh, f uh, over q, so this is a, fine, this is a number field, uh, it's an imaginary CM field, and uh, and a global representation, so a representation, another mod p representation, now of the absolute Galois group. I see I never defined that, that gk is the absolute Galois group of k. Apologies. This is the absolute Galois group of f. Um, so a d-dimensional global representation, uh, which is irreducible, and it's automorphic, Uh, in the sense, in Christoph's talk, uh, sense of Christoph's talk this morning, um, i.e., uh, it comes from some automorphic, some cuspidal automorphic representation on some rank D unitary group which is compacted infinity. Uh, so I'll just say it comes from an automorphic representation for, uh, let's just say, UD. So, so here it is, uh, you're working with uh, fi uh, characteristic P coefficients, so you're, what kind of Langlands you're I, I just mean it's the reduction mod P of something from characteristic zero. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean, one point about using these, these um, these unitary groups which are compacted infinities, you only have an H0, so there's no question about whether you can lift a characteristic zero or not. You just write down your kind of algebraic modular forms and they, they do just all come from characteristic zero. Yes. I mean, equivalently, by a bunch of trace formula results and so on, I could be saying that it comes from the reduction mod P of the Gal representation associated to some um, conjugate self-dual automorphic representation of GLD. All, all of these things are the same, and in the, if you imagine that d equals 2, you, there's, a, there's a version of this where it would just be Hilbert modular forms instead. Just any kind of reasonable kind of case where there's discrete series automorphic representations. Okay, so, so far there's no content to this theorem um, such that, so it's going to have some relationship to this. So for all places v dividing p of f, uh, fv is isomorphic to k, the field I have uh, above, and well, I would like to say that, that locally at all the places, this R bar is given by this, this row bar. I can't quite say that. So what I will say is that either R bar restricted to GFV 
is also isomorphic to row bar, or the same thing is true if I replace V with its complex conjugate. And so why am I saying that? Well, the point is that um, the definition of automorphic uh, implies that there's some conjugate self-duality. So something like R, and I may well get a sign error here, uh, but the complex conjugate and the dual are isomorphic up to some twist by the mod piece cyclotomic character to the 1 minus n. As I said, I apologize if I've got the, the power the wrong way around. But in particular, this means that... Um, uh, sorry, what is R? Ah, sorry, thank you. Sorry, sorry, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so what this means is that if you... This, these two representations determine each other. They're given by... One is the dual twisted of the other. So um, if you like, what you can do is you, you can insist that this CM field actually contains an imaginary quadratic field. And what I can do is just make one choice in which P splits. And I can just make <coughs> the choice of one prime in, above P in that. And then I say... For all the places above there, my local, my global representation locally looks like this. Okay, so why do I care about these theorems? Um, kind of lots of reasons. One, one remark is that if P doesn't divide 2D, so under this assumption here, then this theorem here is implying this one, because essentially by definition, if, if this Gal representation is automorphic, it means it comes from automorphic forms, so it lifts the characteristic zero. So in particular, if the global representation is lifting, then so is the local one. Of course, in the proof, uh, I'm not of course, but in, in the proof, we, the proof of this is actually purely local, and it's an input into this. So it turns out that it's not, as far as we know, um, in, in any method that's known for lifting global representations, I, I'm going to say global for representations of uh, the absolute Galois group of a, a number field. All techniques that we know for lifting mod p representations of a global field to characteristic zero you need to know the existence of lifts everywhere locally. There's not, there doesn't seem to be a way to go in the other direction. So it seems like you always need uh, things like this to, <coughs> to get things like this. I should also say it's, it's kind of the, the analogous statement locally, if you're, at, uh, if you're looking at mod L representations for L not equal to P, it's pretty easy to prove by hand that everything lifts. So the only kind of ambiguity in, in this local questions is exactly at P. Um, one reason to care about this kind of theorem is this, this is giving you some local to global principle. So this is giving you some way of taking a purely local mod P representation and then viewing it as something local in a global situation. Um, and using this, it's not so hard to then, uh, if, you, if you look at lifts of this row bar to, to characteristic zero, say, you can then kind of see them um, globally as well as living inside things corresponding to some space of piadic automorphic forms. So when you're trying to do things in, in the Langlands program, it's often useful to, even just the first proofs of class field theory were given, local class field theory was proved by putting it in a global situation. And similarly, the only proof, I think, at the moment of local Langlands is for GLN is to, is to put it in a Shimura variety situation. So one motivation for this kind of result is that uh, you can use this kind of thing together with, with techniques from the taylor Wiles method and so on to give candidates for Piadic local Langlands and... Uh, things like this. Um, and also, in particular, it's, it's kind of proved useful for this, this Broimazar conjecture that um, is kind of one of the central problems in, in trying to prove better modularity lifting theorems. It's a purely local question, but a lot of the recent progress, is due to an idea of Kissin, has been to, to prove global results and deduce local ones from them. And theorems like this are, are what let us kind of take a local situation and make it global. Um, final thing I want to say about this theorem before I start talking about proofs and so on uh, is that probably this assumption here is not so crucial. It's kind of fairly orthogonal to the method. It comes up at some technical point when proving some automorphy lifting theorems. Uh, I think at least the assumption that P doesn't divide D could be removed using um, some recent work of Broy, Hellman and Schren. And Quite probably you can remove the assumption that P is not 2, but I don't think anyone's thought so much about it. But it's certainly, you should think of this as being basically orthogonal to the, to the methods we're using here. <coughs> okay, so what I want to do in, 
the rest of the time is talk a bit about the proof of theorem one and a bit about the proof of theorem two. Uh, any questions before I do that? Yes. Is it uh, really important to have parallel, uh, I mean, the same representation uh, for all V? Um, it depends what you want to do. So, so um, you, in some sense, yes. It, 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 I mean, at, at the very least, you would probably want to either have the same representation or a representation that you understood really well. I mean, the advantage of this is if you if you have some, you're trying to prove some some statement about some local representation. It's kind of advantageous to just have just that local representation that you're dealing with and not have to sort of think about other ones at the same time. Um, Certainly, there's one instance of this kind of result is a, there's an earlier result of mine and Mark Hisson's in the case d equals two, where we use this to prove uh, the Broimazar conjecture for potentially bottle Tate representations. And there, it was certainly extremely useful to have just copies of the one representation. Um, yeah. So here it's implicit that convex conjugation acts without fixed points on the places above p, or, or do, do you don't care how come? Well, it's an imaginary CM field, so. Um, ah, yes, sorry. Yes, you're right. Uh, I, should, I should probably have said that. So uh, if, if I've got f over f plus, if this is the maximal totally real field, then implicit in what I'm saying, uh, I mean, is coming out, is that p is going to split. I think you can prove versions of these kind of statements in which it doesn't split, but I haven't thought too much. I should be careful. Yeah, thank you. I'm above this split completely in... Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So... Yes, <laughs> that should have been, that was not so very clear. So that should have been V splitting as WWC or something. But in, in particular, there's no, I'm not, tr I, I don't have any control on how big this field is. So in practice, I think even probably in the construction, maybe the first step is that we choose an imaginary quadratic field and then everything is an extension of that. So it's an imaginary, imagine there's just an imaginary quadratic field to start with in which P splits and then everything is, is lying over that. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, Ariane. You have one lifting, or sometimes you have more than one lifting? Uh, we can construct lots of lifts. So we can construct lifts where we don't have complete control over them. But for example, we can make the Hodge take weights arbitrarily spread out, or we can make them kind of all lie within some range that's like kind of d times p minus d minus one times p or something, whatever the kind of best thing you expect is. We certainly don't have production of all of them. And in fact, the construction involves. I guess the construction naturally produces a, a kind of moduli space of lifts that of some fixed weights and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly in, in general, you expect, and I guess it follows from this, that you have lifts to infinitely many different sets of Hodge tape weights and so on. There's a, there's a lot of lifts. Yeah. OK, so, so maybe, yeah, let me say a bit about the proof of theorem one. So kind of. Sort of case zero, as it were, is the kind of the easy case, as I already said, is that if the case that rho bar is irreducible. So this is easy because there's, a, there's kind of a simple classification of these things, which is also quite easy to prove. Um, the, the point is that wild inertia is, um, is, is the, you know, the pro P subgroup of inertia. And that has to act, we're acting on a, a space in characteristic P, and that means it has to act with some fixed vector, just because a group of P power order acting on something of P power order has some fixed thing. And since we're assuming it's irreducible, this just tells you that wild inertia actually acts trivially, because so that implies that uh, rho bar is tame. And then the tame thing is, is also easy. You've got the Frobenius and you've got tame inertia that you know explicitly how this works. And in particular, what's happening, uh, it turns out, is that you just have um, on inertia some list of characters and Frobenius is permuting them. So if you raise Frobenius to a big enough power, it's acting trivially and your representation splits up as a sum of characters. So the conclusion, kind of messing around a bit, is that rho bar is actually induced uh, from some unramified extension. Uh, so, unramified uh, degree D. Okay, but then, then life is nice. You can just lift chi bar 
to a character, you can lift characters very easily, even with complete control over making them crystalline with hodge weights and so on. And so you lift chi bar to some character chi. Uh, and you can arrange the hodge tape weights of chi to be, well, you can arrange, sorry, you can arrange chi to be uh, crystalline. And you have kind of control over the hodge tape weights. You can kind of choose the hodge tape weights of chi to be distinct. And then you set rho to be the induction of chi. Okay, so the, the case of an irreducible representation is is somehow no, no, not much harder than the case of a character, and the case of a character is easy. So, so then there's a, there's a natural strategy at this point, which is uh, the one that's been employed, I think, any time anyone's tried to, to solve this problem, is just, you do exactly this, you, you lift, you, you look at the irreducible subquotients, you lift each of them, and then you just try and lift the extension classes. So, strategy is just um, sort of right row bar isomorphic to row one bar, row n bar, with the row i irreducible, uh, choose row i lifting row i bar, and then try and lift to uh, row one, row n. Okay, and well, I already said that I can I can choose my my row i's to be crystalline, and if I choose that the Hodge tape weights of kind of row i are bigger than the Hodge tape weights of row i plus one maybe even plus one. So by this, when, when I write this, I mean that kind of the minimum of these is bigger than the maximum of these plus one, for example. If this kind of condition holds, then, then in fact this representation, let me just call this rho, this implies that rho is uh, crystalline. So this, this kind of statement, um, I kind of know at least two references by people in the audience for this kind of statement. One is that, um, at least for, for, GL, for KB and QP, these, these statements are kind of analysed carefully in, in Perrin Ryu's article on ordinary representations in pre epidique And you can also compute these, these things. Um, you can prove this just by, your, so you're trying to prove that every extension of these representations is automatically crystalline, and you can read that off from the formulas for the dimension of H1F in, in Jan's article on periodic height pairings. Um, probably these things were very well known to people in the 1980s, and that's not my history. But, um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a reasonable strategy. If you can lift these irreducible things, as long as you can lift the extension classes, then you get crystalline representations. I'm sorry, when you say the object weights, it's of course the weights for each embedding of K into... Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so just make the statement for every embedding. And you impose this inequality on the image. All, all I really need is that the Hodge tape weights are strictly, the Hodge tape weights here are in every embedding are bigger than here. All and uh, all of them are bigger. And in at least one embedding that's bigger than, uh, bigger than, bigger by at least one. I basically need to avoid the case that the ratio, that they, there's, there's a twist by the cyclotomic character. That's what <laughs> I'm trying to avoid. Yeah, that's the only thing. I mean, because there are, of course, extensions of the trivial representation by the cyclotomic character that are semi-stable and not crystalline. If I wanted to have, I mean, I should also say that these methods are quite flexible and all these lifts and you can produce potentially crystalline lifts of some type. I could produce semi-stable lifts and, you know, but this is just to kind of make this all fine. Okay, so let me just show you what's kind of, I mean, this sounds very good and I, I think anyone who ever thought about this problem, as I say, like pretty much had this idea and kind of checked that for GL2 you could do this and then kind of assumed that you could 
do things more generally. I mean, I think several people I know got the set this as a PhD problem and you know, you get quite far. You, I say Muller managed to do the GL3 case quite nicely, but then it's, it kind of gets very tricky when you try and do the higher dimensional cases. Uh, and I think there's a good reason for that that I'll try and explain. So, okay, so what about the GL2 case? So let's just imagine D equals two, chi one bar, chi two bar. And maybe even that um, there's no loss of generality in, in twisting this, uh, this chi two bar away. So let me just set chi bar is chi one bar, chi two bar inverse. And so let's just take rho bar is some chi bar zero, one. Okay, so then, then I choose some chi um, lifting chi bar, which is going to ZP bar star. And then the question I have to ask myself is, well, the extensions here are parameterized by the H1 of this, this character. So I can ask, uh, does H1 of chi subject onto h1 uh, chi bar. And of course, the answer is usually yes, but not always, because there's an h2 that can intervene. So, so if you choose, kind of choose a random character, then, then yes, this is fine. And as long as this holds, then I win, because I just take my extension class given by rho bar here, and I just take any lift, and that gives me my representation. But it's not always uh, subjective. So maybe let me do the kind of the hard case for k equals qp is uh, the case that chi bar is epsilon bar, the mod p cyclotomic character. So this is the case where you have a non trivial h2. So let me just imagine that, um, that in fact, just for, for ease of writing, let's just imagine that I'm actually temporarily just actually having characters valued in ZP rather than ZP bar, just so I can write mod P and uh, have it be FP. And then you have the kind of long exact sequence in Kermodi. So I, well, I have the short exact sequence, sort of ZP, I have a copy of ZP with chi acting on it. I have multiplication by P. I have FP bar. So I can write chi bar or epsilon bar. So now I take cohomology. Sorry? Oh, not a bar. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and so I get that uh, this mod p maps to what I care about. But there's a co kernel given by the P torsion in the H2. Uh, and this, this is genuinely not zero. So, um, I mean, in particular, this is, uh, as long as chi is not actually the cyclotomic character, uh, no, maybe even then, then typically this, this thing here is one dimensional over FP. This is a rank one ZP module. And this, this thing here is two dimensional. So there is unsurprisingly, this co-kernel. Um, but I take duality you can turn the h2 into an h0. Um, so uh, this becomes h0 of uh, gqp with coefficients. I always get my twists wrong, so let's see if I can get this right. qp mod zp um, probably want uh, epsilon times chi inverse. And I'm writing too big. Uh, and this is mapping to h1 of gk. And now the trivial character, which is just hom uh, gk. So this is, this is kind of the, the dual of this. And what we need to see is that we can actually, um, well, firstly, you, you can compute what this co-boundary is. It's, it's something 
easy, which I'll explain in a second. But you kind of need to see that you're going to have to see that by varying this character chi, you can fill out everything here. So this is the kind of first place you see that there's something subtle is that because the h1 for chi is going to be one dimensional and the h1 for chi bar is two dimensional, you need to allow yourself to vary your choice of chi. So while I said that the strategy was to kind of choose a lift, if I literally fix a lift, I can't, do, I can't make things work. So we need to allow chi to vary. to uh, kind of fill out all of all of the possible cl classes here. So it turns out is everything okay? Cool, thanks. Um, it turns out that uh, we just have to allow some unramified twists. Uh, to twist by unramified characters. Uh, so let me kind of, I'll sort of say explicitly, in this situation, uh, where my mod p character is the mod p cyclotomic character, I'm going to take um, well, if we think about what I was doing over there, I said I wanted the Hodge Tate weights. I wanted to choose my lift so that the Hodge Tate weights were sort of increasing by more than one. So the obvious way to lift this, this mod P cyclotomic character would be to the cyclotomic character. But then the, the jump in Hodge Tate weights isn't big enough. So I sort of take chi to be instead the peak power of the cyclotomic character. Then all my extensions really will be crystalline. And I will twist it by an unramified character here. So lambda A is some unramified character taking the Frobenius at P to A and ZP star. <laughs> and then it turns out that the... Um, but you could also take P equal 1 and take an unarmified character non-trivial. I could indeed do that. It's just slightly cleaner for me not to do it right now, but yes. Uh, as long as my, my unarmified character was non-trivial, then, then that, that would work. It's just slightly easier for me to just sort of say I'm going to do that and then... Uh, and it also makes the kind of calculation you do here slightly easier, um, not to have to worry about what, what's going on when you're taking the H0, because if, if again, this is kind of bad. If I actually had the cyclotomic character, this H0 is really a QP mod ZP. But as long as this, this chi is not literally the cyclotomic character, then this is of uh, finite length. Anyway, what happens is that this, uh, sorry for switching back and forth between the boards so much, but the, the kind of co-boundary here is basically this map um, if chi is whatever it's in there, lambda a epsilon to the p, this maps to kind of a minus 1 over p. Um, as long as a minus 1 is, is exactly the way, as long as this is non-zero, this is giving me some scalar, which is, um, and this is, this is I think, the, uh, the unramified map sending Fabinius to this a minus 1 on p. Let me just kind of put this in quotes. But this is, I mean, you can imagine how co-boundaries work. You, you, I mean, you know how to do this in short exact sequences. You do some lift, and, and it turns out that what you have to do is you have to kind of consider sort of the smallest power of P modulo, which this character is not the trivial character. And then you, you take the difference between the trivial character and divide out by that power of P. That gives you something non-trivial, and that's how you do this kind of computation. And this is something you can, that extends to a very general situation. So anyway, what happens is it turns out that you need to kind of vary A in such a way as you're varying this quantity A minus 1 over P. And as you vary A, this does indeed vary, and you manage to span all the classes you need to. So this is, this is some indication of how you, you make a proof like this. Um, and you can kind of do this in a sort of very, very concrete way. So this is something you can do for this, this, this GL2 case. Um, now, now you try and do GL3, and it turns out that the kind of problem that you can have is if you look at cases that look like <coughs> having, basically the problem is always having lots of characters with ratios being the cyclotomic character. So this is already kind of bad. Um, 
I think what happens is that maybe, I forget the exact details, but the, the kind of thing that happens when is that you start having trouble, not when you're kind of in the generic situation where lots of things are, all the, all the things are non-split as possible, but you really start having problems when you actually have some non-split things. So this thing, kind of thing is, is, not so is not so bad, I think, although if I now take, if I write down this formula, but now k is qp z to p, for example, rather than qp, then things are suddenly a lot worse because this, this character is trivial and suddenly all my characters have ratio which are both trivial character and cyclotomic character and I have h2s and h0s and things are kind of nasty. You can still do all this kind of thing by hand and this is what Muller does, I mean not quite by hand, with, with some cleverness. Um, and you can prove that you have lifts, what you have to do is you, you lift this to sort of epsilon I'll get my numbers wrong, sort of 2p times lambda a, epsilon to the p lambda b. Uh, I guess I only need to do one. You can, you can always make lifts like this. But the other kind of scary thing that happens is you, it's hard to do an induction. So what seems to be hard to do is to either choose your b here, make a lift here, and then try and kind of lift to this, or to do it the other way around. So however you kind of split things up, you get into some trouble. You basically find that when you, when you come to make lifts up here, you maybe need to go back and choose this B a bit more carefully. As I say, in the rank three cases, it's fine, but it's, it's kind of easy to write down. Once you, once you try this, you can then kind of make up hard examples for yourself, and you do some rank four or five example, and it's just completely hideous. You can actually find examples where provably, no matter how you break it up into an extension of two smaller pieces, there's kind of no way that you could have chosen your lift for the two things independently and then made the lift of the whole thing, even if you do some unramified twist. Basically, what you need to do is you need to, if you're doing some inductive argument, at every stage, you need to be able to go back and refine all the choices you made in the earlier stages. It turns out that it does always work. And as I say, we, we do always produce by this theorem, these ordinary lifts. But I think any kind of way to do it by hand is, is just basically doomed as soon as the dimension is at least maybe five and certainly six. You're just, the conditions you write down are too complicated. Okay, so morally, though you can kind of see what you want to do, what you want to do, I mean, you don't want to make explicit choices. What you want to do is kind of just consider instead, like maybe fix here my powers of the cyclotomic character, and then I want to just consider kind of the moduli space where I let kind of A and B both vary and all these extension classes vary. And I just want to show maybe that that moduli space is big enough that when I look at the reductions mod P, I see all the mod P representations. That's the kind of thing that seems more natural to, to be able to do. And you can kind of, when you do these calculations, you kind of feel like this is all going to work. Basically, what kind of happens is that the hard cases sort of involve some of these extension classes being split rather than non-split. And that's imposing some condition that makes the kind of space of mod p things smaller. And correspondingly, when you look at the space of possible lifts, it's imposing some conditions, but these conditions are like in kind of quite high co-dimension. It feels like generically you kind of win. If you just kind of chose at random possible lifts, then, then everything would be okay. But the problem is actually proving that. Um, but that's how we prove things in the end. So we exactly do build some moduli spaces. Um, let me kind of state a precise theorem, again, kind of just in this same kind of setting about what we, what we prove, and then let me say something about how we prove it. So this is theorem three, which um, kind of easily implies theorem one by induction. So given uh, a crystalline, or well, given two crystalline representations, Uh, one is called rho d, it's a d-dimensional representation. And one is um, a-dimensional, and it's just an arbitrary irreducible crystalline representation. So with... Um, well, in fact, it's not just irreducible, it's irreducible mod P. So alpha bar <laughs> goes to GLD, sorry, GLA FP bar is irreducible. 
And I'll demand my same condition on Hodge Tate weights. So let's assume that the Hodge Tate weights of rho d are bigger than the Hodge Tate weights of alpha, maybe plus 1. Then what I'm going to show is that I can lift any extension of alpha bar by rho d bar to an extension in characteristic 0. So uh, then any <coughs> extension rho d bar to, uh, let's just say, rho d plus a bar. So this is just my name for some d plus a dimensional representation to alpha bar to 0 uh, lifts to And now I have to be slightly careful. I'm not going to lift it to an extension of alpha by rho d because I can't literally do that, like, just like I can't lift every extension of the trivial character by the mod p cyclotomic character to an extension of the trivial character by any particular given lift. So I, now, I need to allow some flexibility in, in my lifting. So what do I do? I have uh, rho d primed, uh, rho d plus a, uh, alpha 0. So alpha is the representation I fixed up there. Uh, rho d plus a is crystalline. And so of course rho d primed is crystalline. And uh, with the Hodge tate weights of rho primed d being the Hodge tate weights of rho d. So, and this lifts this in the sense that this lifts this representation, this lifts this one. So this is, this is genuinely a lift. So in fact, we actually have more control than this. Um, what we really prove is not just that these have the same Hodge Tate weights, but they lie on the same uh, irreducible component of the, of the corresponding crystalline deformation ring. So we have the same mod representation, mod P. We look at all of the possible, there's a moduli space of the, the lifts of that, and what we're demanding is that this lies on the same irreducible component. So in particular, it has the same Hodge Tate weights. So once you have this theorem, it's very easy to prove theorem 1 just by induction on D. You're just, uh, just adding an extra representation at the end and just producing this. OK, so how do we prove this? Uh, sorry, bad management of my boards. Well, basically, what we do is we kind of employ the strategy I, I talked about here of just kind of considering, I mean, you just kind of like consider all possible lifts. So what, what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to consider all possible lifts of rho bar d to one of these rho d primes. And then we're going to consider all kind of possible lifts of the extension class. And then just sort of show that this thing is well behaved. So. Um, so given uh, rho d, there exists uh, kind of a formal scheme that, um, yeah, let's call it spoof r rho bar d. And what is this thing? This is going to be the universal, I should say, framed a deformation ring for crystalline lifts of rho d bar um, with kind of Hodge Tate weights uh, equal to the Hodge Tate weights of rho d. So I know that I have some crystalline representation, so I, this is some non-zero thing. And it's just literally, it's a modulized space for all the possible lifts which are crystalline and have these given fixed Hodge Tate weights. So for example, kind of in the case above, uh, if rho d bar is um, mod p cyclotomic character and rho d was the cyclotomic character to the power of p, 
I'd just be looking at um, <coughs> just a power series ring corresponding to kind of to a minus one, I guess. Okay, so it's just the unramified twists in that case. In general, it's, it's something much more complicated. I don't want to try and like make it explicit. I wouldn't know how to, but it's something. So this is kind of a sensible object to be thinking about because I'm allowing myself all possible choices of how to lift this this row d bar. So when I, I don't know much the theory, but when you define uh, the modular problem, uh, so does it make sense to speak about crystalline representations? So no. So so what you do is you is you can kind of construct the universal ring with no conditions at all, and then you can take the Zariski closure of all of the crystalline points, and that that's something that you can do. So you can look at all the specializations of it at ZP bar points and ask if those are crystalline, and then you show that the Zariski closure of that is some sensible object, and you can compute its dimension and so on. Um, framed just means that you have to carry around a basis, because because there's automorphisms. But yeah, it's kind of it's harmless for everything. Okay, so so then over this space, uh, I can think about um, there's kind of a sheaf of the extensions, the kind of x two g k of uh, alpha by the kind of maybe I'm going to write rho d universal for the for the kind of universal guy representation living over this. So I can kind of consider this, this sheaf, of, which is just the analog of my H2 above. And it turns out that basically this is kind of, um, this is where all the difficulty is. If this thing just vanished, there would be no problem and everything would, you, you just lift all your X1 classes, everything is, is easy. So we have to have kind of have some kind of control over this. Um, by our assumptions on uh, the Hodge tape weights and so on, this thing is, is uh, at least set theoretically supported on the special fiber. There's no x2 in characteristic zero. There's no ratio being cyclotomic. Um, but I have to kind of worry about how big this might be. I mean, this is exactly where this kind of a minus one on p thing is coming from. So there's also a kind of a universal, something that's like a universal family over here. So this is the kind of thing where, that, where I'm kind of considering all of my possible lifts to extensions. Um, this is kind of the universal family, except it actually turns out that this is not, um, because this x2 is not zero, this is not a vector bundle. This is, there's some, some torsion here. Uh, exactly in this case um, that I was looking at, this is exactly where this a minus one and p comes in. So what we need to do is, to kind of consider properly the universal family of extensions, you have to be able to make sense of things like this a minus one over p. And of course, here, this, this doesn't make sense. I'm not allowed to divide this by p. But what I do, how do I, how do I make that make sense? Is, is It turns out, I mean, just think about that particular case. You need to make some kind of blow up to make these, these functions reasonable. So what we need to do, and what we do do, is we uh, replace... Um, this thing here, uh, we're calling this by a blow up, uh, kind of at the support of x2. And then you have to do some work, but it turns out that, that basically, I mean, you can make that construction and that doesn't tell you anything. I mean, a priori, you know nothing. But it turns out that all you need to do to make everything reasonable and make, an, make a kind of fairly straightforward argument about the existence of lifts is just to have some control about how big the support of this is. So it turns out that what we need, the kind of key uh, input to make this work, is, um, is the following bound. We need that the co-dimension uh, so for any r greater than or equal to 1, uh, the co-dimension of the kind of locus of kind of points so that 
um, the dimension of this x2 uh, is greater than or equal to r, that this co-dimension is at least r. So for, for r, is r is 1, for example, I'm, not, I'm saying that I don't have this x2 is not supported everywhere. That would be kind of my, my disaster. And similarly, it turns out, I just need to know this in all dimensions, that so the locus of things where this x2 is, is very big is a very small locus. So if you think about the kind of example I was writing down for GL3, maybe it still survives. Um, so by take duality, like the... I mean, the, lo the loci where, where this x2 is big is exactly to do with having, having lots of uh, kind of characters here whose ratio is a cyclotomic character uh, and having non-split extensions there. So having sort of zeros here is making some x2 bigger. And kind of intuitively, the only way you can make the x2 bigger is by, putting, by making a, imposing a bunch of conditions. OK, that's not kind of meaningful in some sense, though, and I'm kind of getting to the punchline of, of why we need to do quite a lot of work to actually... And that key input turns out to be a lot of work to prove. Because when I'm kind of saying, oh, I'm like thinking about this and I'm putting a zero here and it's imposing some conditions and making things smaller, implicitly I'm talking about some object where I'm allowing this mod p representation to vary. Whereas in all of this, this whole thing here, this row bar d was completely fixed. So, um, so this x2 of rho d universal, uh, maybe I'll just write rho, let me just write rho d for a second just to be not carrying around too many symbols, uh, by alpha, have I got, am I writing this the wrong way around, alpha by rho d, thank you, uh, by Tate duality is isomorphic to uh, Holmes from rho d, to uh, alpha twisted by the cyclotomic character. So what I'm trying to, to do is I'm trying to say that inside this, this deformation space of, of all the kind of possible liftings, I'm wanting to have some bound on, on some kind of reducibility locus. I'm kind of saying, how often can I admit a map from my deformation to this representation, this, this fixed irreducible representation? And that's kind of some question that seems quite hard to, to say much about in general. So when, when row bar is fixed, so what we do uh, is we build instead um, a moduli stack of uh, phi gamma modules uh, whose uh, ZP bar points are uh, exactly the the crystalline uh, representations of GK uh, was fixed. Tate weights. So phi gamma modules and gal representations are not the same thing in families, but they are when you uh, when you look at the kind of points over fields or over complete, over, over kind of ZP or ZP bar or something. Um, and I'm not making any requirement here that the mod P representation is fixed. So then we prove. that this is actually a formal algebraic stack. Uh, and so the special fiber is just um, an algebraic stack Uh, over 
fp bar. And then inside this, this now sees all the mod p representations which come from crystalline representations of that given, those given Hodge tape weights. But now, um, now those, those mod p representations are allowed to vary. So then inside here, uh, so inside this stack, you can kind of uh, the substack of representations with uh, the dimension of the x2 of alpha bar. Now let's just say I'm going to work mod p. The whole calculation can now happen mod p. Uh, this is greater than or equal to r. But you can compute this now just by Galois cohomology. So now I'm like literally looking at, at representations that kind of admit alpha bar as a quotient. So I'm looking at representations of this form. And it's pretty easy to compute just using Galois cohomology that the dimension of this is, um, well, that I want to prove there's a co-dimension of at least r, but in fact, it's much better than that. You can, uh, particularly if k is, is ramified, you can get at least a quadratic growth and maybe better. Yes. So a rather naive question. Sure. This substack, now you write of representations, but do you really mean of phi gamma? I really mean of phi gamma modules, but the point is that point-wise, I can, I, it turns out that you can do all these computations point-wise. So yeah, I'm, I'm about to be over time if I'm not already, so I'm going to... Not, not say so much, but yeah, you use the um, the air complex law on it. Should. That's a stack over ZP bar. It turns out that the computation can actually just happen in the special fiber. So I have uh, just an algebraic stack over FP bar, and I literally get to do a computation just on its <coughs> points. And I get to do a computation using Galois cohomology, and, and it's kind of easy to inductively prove. And the dimension condition is defined by you need some scheme structure by fitting idea or something like how do you, because usually they met, this defines a set and not a. Uh, kind of schemes, well, this is this. Uh, there's no cohomology in degree bigger than two, and so it's not so hard to check that. I mean, the, the, I'm just looking at the dimension of support of of the H two. Um, yeah, we can we can talk about this after. I mean, I don't want to. It's not. This is not a problem. Uh, I just wanted to say like 20 seconds on theorem two. Um, I'm sorry, I completely wrote a two-hour <coughs> talk. Um, theorem 1 implies theorem 2 using uh, this kari vantenberger method that I've left myself no time to say anything about. Um, so what I can literally say is that for GL2, um, this implication is basically literally, there's an argument, Kari and vantenberger found this great way of given a mod p global representation of, of constructing lifts with very carefully prescribed properties. And they did this for GL2 over QP to, to prove Sayers conjecture. They, they kind of, they basically, any time that you would expect rho bar to come from modular forms, any kind of congruence you would expect from the modular form side, they managed to construct purely on the Galois side. And their argument for GL2, um, if you kind of put our theorem in as an input, this comes out. So, what we need for GLD is some, some kind of version that in D dimensions, which has been basically built by the work of quite a lot of people on automorphic lifting theorems for higher dimensions. But the, the key argument is really this, this argument here, but I'm definitely over time, so I apologize, I'll stop. Okay, are there any questions? Is there a global analog of your local stack? Um, not that I know of. Um, it's a little harder to expect something. So, so mod p, for example, there are at least, you know, in, you, you have all these mod p representations of the absolute Galois group. If you wanted to do something globally that made sense, you would certainly want mod p there to, to be something. So you would need some modulized space of mod p representations. So if, for example, you, I mean, it seems reasonably natural that you would bound the conductor away from p or something and as soon as you do that then conjecturally there are only be finitely many representations like and this is true by Sayers conjecture for gl2 if you're looking at odd representations so yeah um i think in some sense actually what happens so we we have some of these stacks for crystalline representations we also have a much bigger stack that has all of the representations 
Um, but that, the special fibre of that is not actually an algebraic stack. That's still formal. And somehow the way the dimensions work out is that the, the dimension of the, the kind of crystalline part um, plus the dimension of sort of global deformations adds up to the total dimension. And some, somehow I think the reason... So these crystalline things seem to be about the biggest kind of algebraic stack, which is actually... Um, sorry, the biggest sort of thing which is, which is genuinely algebraic mod P and not formal. And I think in some sense the reason why you can't go any bigger than that is, is to something to do with a lack of global families. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's some, there's some analogue, but I don't, I don't see what it would be. And this is something about the geometry of this modular stack, and especially special fiber, and uh, also the, the, the uh, infinitesimal structure, maybe in a relation to the x, uh, x1, x2. Yeah, so, so there's a lot you can say about it. So, so, so in fact, yeah, so, so essentially by definition, the, the, the infinitesimal deformations um, at, at points in this stack are recovering these, these Gower deformation rings of, of Meso and, and so on. Um, either unrestricted, if I, if I kind of remove this word crystalline, or in this case the crystalline things. Um, the global geometry, we don't know so much, but we do, what we do know, which is, turns out to be very useful in applications and is kind of actually important here, is that by thinking a lot about kind of families of extensions, we can, com we can compute uh, exactly how many irreducible components there are and give a kind of description of what the generic representations on them are. So it turns out that in characteristic P, slightly surprisingly, uh, for each irreducible component, basically, generically, it is, in fact... Um, completely reducible. So the irreducible things are actually a very small. Irreducible representations are just kind of some scattered points. Yeah. Th well. Yeah. So so generically, these these are for each irreducible component. You get these, and and the the chi i's bars are kind of fixed on inertia. Uh, so if you think about how that works, you you can kind of work out all all the possible things. Um, there's a natural way of labeling them by irreducible representations um, about the algebraic group, but I won't go into that. Um, it's probably possible to prove that the, this thing is a comp local complete intersection. I'm not totally sure what's been proved. Um, it's certainly expected to be. Uh, no, meaning the, the special fiber, at least, of the, of the, of the stack. Um, basically because, I mean, the, again, if I remove the word crystalline, so the special fiber, it turns out the special fiber of the whole thing, even without the crystalline, is, is the same as the, with the crystalline things. Basically because every, all the mod P representations have crystalline lifts, which is part of how it's all proved. Uh, but it's expected that if I look at deformation rings, not with this crystalline condition, just the unrestricted deformation ring, those are expected to always be local complete intersections. And I think this has been proven, it's certainly known for GL2. I think it's now close to being proved in general. Um, complex, yeah. yeah, so... There's a lot of interesting questions, but I, I, yeah, I, I could talk about this at some length, but probably I, I should not run too much into Laurent's talk. Okay, any other questions? No, back to you then. <laughs>